Good morning, Grace. Thank you for joining us online. My name is Joe. Would you sing with me today? step. May we not take a breath without you, God. May you lead our steps, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for wanting to guide us, Lord. So guide us because we are in need of you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, Grace. I'm Brian, and I want to take a moment to invite you to something that will change your experience here at Grace. Have you ever been in a relationship where you just wish they would tell you what they wanted? It's incredibly frustrating, isn't it? Well, no relationship is complete unless the conversation goes two ways. Well, at Grace, we do a lot of sharing, but our heart, our desire is to get to know you better so that we can bless you better. We want to hear from you. We want to take a few minutes today to do that. This is your opportunity to be heard, 
and our opportunity to identify ways that will help you build a community that is geared specifically for you. On the screen, there's a link to a very short survey. I want you to take a moment right now and go to that link. Now, I know a lot of you filled this out two weeks ago when we first mentioned it, but if you didn't, here is your chance. You don't wanna miss out because we wanna make sure that everything we create benefits you. So the more you share, the more you'll be able to get out of grace. Now, over the coming weeks and months, God has placed a lot of things on our hearts, some great ideas for building community as we move into our new space at the Bolston Quarter. And we wanna make sure that these opportunities for community are designed with you in mind. One of my favorite questions on this survey is what are you passionate about? Or wouldn't it be great if you could find opportunities and resources for your passion or a Christian community that could help you develop your interests and and provide some wholesome, amazing people to connect with. We've said it over and over again here at Grace. Your friends determine the direction and quality of your life. By taking a few minutes for this survey, you increase your chances of making the most out of your time here at Grace Community Church. Thank you so much for opening up that survey, getting started on it, and finishing it out, and helping make Grace a better place. Now, here's Pastor Derek, with today's message. Well, we're in our final part of this Be Rich series, this generosity campaign to give, serve, and love our community. And you know, I love giving and serving. And by the way, um, if you haven't yet had a chance to sign up to serve, you can go to trygrace.org slash be rich. There's still time to do that. But the, the cool thing about giving and serving is that they're, they're tangible. They're measurable. We can see that we did something. But you know, this, this whole love thing, man, it, this, this is actually the hardest of the three, but, but I would argue is the most important. You know, the Apostle Paul has some powerful words to say about love. And it's almost always, these words are almost always uh, read at weddings. And so we always think of them in the context of marriage. But what I want to do is I want to read them to you. And I want to encourage you to think about how these words apply to your own life. Paul writes, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Whoa, what is Paul saying there? I mean, how can you do all these amazing things and literally be nothing? Well, you actually know what Paul's talking about a little bit because you probably can remember a time in your life where someone did something for you, but they didn't do it with love. And you almost would have rather that they had not done it at all because they didn't do it with love. You know, I have to confess I don't do the dishwasher thing with love. You know, the dishwasher, man, it's a great concept. Like, I love the idea that you don't have to do all the dishes by hand, that you can throw them all into the dishwasher, right? And I have actually some pretty strong opinions about how the dishwasher at my house should be loaded. And I actually do the dishwasher thing quite a bit, but I don't do it with love. In fact, if Paul was writing those words that he just wrote about my dishwasher habits, this is what he would say. If I have the gift of loading the dishwasher and can arrange everything for maximum capacity, and if I can unload the dishwasher faster than anyone in my house, but do not have love, I am nothing. You feel me on this dishwasher thing, by the way? Like, have you ever had a time where you were unloading the dishwasher and just to make sure that people 
around you appreciated what you were doing. You made a little extra noise, like you clanged some plates and, and you know, clinged some glasses together. Or maybe you actually waited to unload the last few things in the dishwasher until someone was coming into the room just so that they could hear and appreciate what you were doing. And then when they were like, hey, thanks so much for unloading the dishwasher, then you were like, oh, sure, no problem. But deep down inside, you were having a lot of very un-Jesus-like thoughts. You know what I'm talking about. What Paul is after here with these verses is we can do all of these amazing things. We can give, we can serve, right? But if we're not doing those things with love in our hearts, and remember, God knows your heart, God sees your heart, then it's ultimately not worth doing at all. So where did Paul get this crazy high view of love? And it's not just Paul, by the way. Look at what Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 8. He says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Did you catch those first two words? He says, above all, like loving one another is the highest thing. Look at another disciple, John in 1 John 3:11. He says, this is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. So this was so critical. It was above all, it was heard from the very beginning, this idea, this value, we have to love one another. Why were all of these disciples saying the same thing? And where did this idea come from? Well, we have to go back to the Gospel of John chapter 13. This is Jesus last night with his disciples. And he saved his last night for his greatest lesson for them and for me and you. We start in, in John 13, verse one. John says, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Now, this betrayal from Judas, that's a different sermon for a different day, but it's important to know here that the Jesus betrayer, Judas, was actually in the room and was part of this amazing experience that Jesus gave to his disciples. John continues, he says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, this was a job for a lowly servant, definitely not one for the man who was called the Messiah, the Son of God. And so, understandably, when it came time for Peter to get his feet washed, Peter, who was the outspoken leader of the disciples, he was like freaking out. He's like, Jesus, no way you're going to do this. No way. And, you know, Peter gets a bad rep, I think. Um, but, but I just believe he was, he was really speaking for everyone in the room who was basically thinking the same thing. Jesus, not, not you. I mean, this task is so far beneath you. This, this is embarrassing, Jesus. And yet Jesus basically argues with Peter and he's like, Peter, you know, sit down, man. You're, you're going to understand this later. And so in verse 12, John writes, when Jesus had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. And then here he goes. He says, you call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So what Jesus is saying here to his disciples, he says, now I've washed your feet, now it's your turn. And you can almost imagine like this is 
Peter's greatest fear coming true. Because basically he hears Jesus say, okay, if I've done this for you, now you can do this for one another. It's, it's like Jesus is saying, look, there's nothing that's beneath you. Because if this task wasn't beneath me, then there's nothing that's beneath you. Definitely not unloading a dishwasher, that's for sure. You see, what Jesus is reminding his disciples, and he's reminding me and you, is that the enemy of love is pride. You see, pride is self-centered, while love is others-centered. And what Jesus is really telling the disciples here is that you can love anyone in the world if you believe that that person or that task isn't beneath you. There's no one you can't love if you don't think that that person isn't beneath you. I remember um, a number of years ago, I had someone in my life um, who was going through a really difficult time and I was walking with them through that time. And, um, and I just, I was really struggling because I felt like every time that I was interacting with them, they were just draining the life out of me. I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like that, but um, I, was, I was talking to a buddy of mine named Charlie. And I said, Charlie, uh, man, I, I don't know if you've got any advice for me, but, but I just feel like with this, with this person in my life, like, I feel like I'm right here and, and they're down here. And, and I just feel like I'm constantly trying to pull them up to my level and they're always pulling me down. Like every conversation is, is, is like that. And he said some profound words to me. He said, Derek, your problem is that you're never on a different level with anybody. He said, in God's eyes, we're all on the same level. We're all human. And he said, anytime that you see yourself on a different level with someone else, you see yourself you know, above them, that they're beneath you, you're going to have this sense of, of feeling drained being around them. So what you have to do is realize you're both on the same level and they have just as much to give to you as you have to give to them. It radically changed the whole relationship because I realized that person, they weren't beneath me. And it was a game changer for me. And then Jesus gives his disciples my favorite verse in the entire Bible. He says in John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another. Now, there was nothing actually new about this command. Um, it was already a command that had been around forever that we're supposed to love. But what was new about it was what Jesus said next. It's how were to love. These 11 words, Jesus says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And with those 11 words, Jesus gives this final command that really encapsulates the entire gospel. It encapsulates the entirety of, of what's in the Bible. He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And how has Jesus loved us? Selflessly, sacrificially, unconditionally. That is how we are to love one another. And so right at the end of washing his disciples' feet, when he says this words, you can understand why on his last night with the disciples that this left such a mark on them. It's why Peter and John and James and Paul and, and the entire early church couldn't stop talking about the importance of love and ultimately couldn't stop loving everyone around them. It's, it's how this whole movement of following Jesus spread throughout the empire. So here's the question for you. Who is God calling you to love? So we're in the final part of this campaign to give and serve and to love our community. Maybe God's calling you to love a friend. Maybe it's a neighbor or a coworker, or maybe it's a family member. 
Heck, maybe it's someone you're going to be seeing this Thanksgiving, or maybe it's someone who's just really challenging in, in your life. But who is God calling you to love? And I want to let you know, there's good news if maybe that person that God has put on your mind right now is, is, a, is a difficult person. Like maybe you don't feel a lot of love in your heart toward that person. Here's the good news. God is going to help you to love that person. So what I want to do right now is to take you through a little experiential exercise. So I'm going to ask that you would stop whatever you're doing right now. Go ahead and just stop what you're doing and grab a comfortable seat. Okay, so just sit down and close your eyes and let me lead you through a little exercise with God. I want you to start by taking a couple of deep breaths. As you breathe in, breathe in the Spirit of God. Be reminded that God is with you right now in this moment. As you take a breath, His life fills your lungs. We're just going to soak in God's presence right now. With your eyes closed, I want you to imagine that you have been invited into that upper room with the disciples on Jesus last night. You're sitting there in that circle and there's Jesus. He has a towel over his arm. He's got a bowl of water. And he's washing the disciples' feet. And then Jesus kneels before your feet. He takes off your shoes. He begins to pour water over your feet. And as he's washing your feet, Jesus looks up and he looks right in your eyes. And in that moment, it's like he knows everything about you. And in that moment, he loves you fully and unconditionally. Now I want you to imagine just days later, you're now standing on a hillside, looking up at a cross, and there's Jesus hanging there between two thieves. And as he's hanging there, you're reminded that he said that he had to do this for you. And there's whispers in the crowd. People are whispering, he just forgave the soldiers who nailed him to that cross. This is the one who is pure love for you all. With your eyes closed, I just want to invite you to just say thank you to Jesus. Say, Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Just thank Jesus right now for the love that you and I don't deserve. Now, with your eyes still closed, let me pray for you. Lord, please help us to love like you love us. God, if you haven't already, please show us who it is that you want us to love. Lord, if we already know who that person is, please give us the courage and fill us with your love so that we can love them the way that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us through this Be Rich series. I pray you'd have an amazing week and we look forward to seeing you for Advent. God bless.